when we started thinking about the human genome uh, the obvious um, uh, thought was that india cannot do it we have never done a human genome before uh, what kind of um, artificial intelligence and genomics uh, intersections are you hoping for let's say in the upcoming 5 or 10 years or even 15 years uh, the first human genome took almost 30 runs of mm. sequence today you can do in less than 48 hours river university presents river podcast uh, welcome to Reva Podcast Series. Uh, I'm Dr. Agnik Haldar. Uh, so with us today, we have renowned uh, genetist, uh, genomics expert, and a true pioneer of the field of genomics and life sciences. Uh, the man that who had first sequenced the human uh, genome from India. Uh, we have Dr. Vinod Skarya, currently working in Karkinos Healthcare, and also an adjunct professor in IIT Kanpur. So, Thank you, Dr. Vinod Sakarya, for uh, gracing us with his presence today. So, to start, you started your career in medicine, and then you transitioned towards genomics and uh, bioinformatics aspects. So, can you tell us a bit more, like, what inspired this shift? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I was probably fortunate to be in the right time uh, when I started and finished uh, my, my my medical uh, education. Um. I finished my MBBS in 2003, and the landmark at that point of time was the human genome. And it was just, I was just fortunate that at the right time, that announcement happened, and uh, in fact, I was enthused uh, by the genome and what uh, was promised out of the genome. In fact, uh, if you really follow the, the announcement um, by the US president, along with the two scientists who contributed to the whole genome, uh, you would realize that the promise was essentially to change the way we practice medicine in the next decades to come. And that was really, uh, I think, the most um, uh, enthusiastic uh, statement to be made uh, for any young medical graduate who would just pass out. Um, and that really motivated me to understand what this is all about. Um, but yeah, fortunately or unfortunately, India was not part of... Uh, uh, the countries who contributed to the human genome, uh, while our neighbor China did contribute to 1% of the human genome. Um, so the thought was, um, if we were to make a difference for patients in India, we need to master this art somehow. Uh, and that really uh, pulled me into looking at genomics and learning genomics that. And, and then I moved to IGAB, which offered the first PhD program in genomics in the country. And it was just natural that that was the first place to be in and uh, to be there. So that brings me to the next question that is, you are renowned for sequencing the first Indian uh, human genome. So uh, could you share the biggest challenges that you faced uh, during that process? Right. So um, so the, the first human genome was not by serendipity, is what I would say. Um, we have always been thinking about sequencing that genome uh, moment, uh, the cost of sequencing started dropping. Um, like I previously said that 1% of human genome was not contributed by India, but by China. And therefore, it was always uh, in us um, that we need to learn how to do this. So um, when we started thinking about the human genome, uh, the obvious um, uh, thought was that India cannot do it. Right? We have never done a human genome before. We, in fact, we have never done a genome before. Uh, so the stopgap was uh, do half of human genome, and uh, that was how the zebrafish genome was mm. sequenced. The zebrafish genome is half of human genome. And uh, uh, my colleague Sridhar, uh, who has been a colleague collaborator for all these years, mm. including in my present role, mm. um, has been very instrumental in this entire process. And in fact, he was a zebrafish biologist, and it was just natural that we decided to do the zebrafish genome. And in fact. The zebrafish genome was announced uh, end of 2008, almost a year before the human genome was announced. Now, once the zebrafish wild type genome was sequenced and announced, then there was some level of confidence that yes, this can be done at, at some level at some point. And, and that really was the changing point. So um, building on that, basically you are also the co-founder for Guardian Consortium. So what are like some of the success stories that stand out from your back venture? Yeah, so I think um, 
the the real success that it'll count on the guardian program was to be able to give hope to a lot more families who never had hope in the first place um many of them had children with genetic diseases many of them had two children with genetic diseases and two children with a genetic disease is something that is avoidable provided genetic counseling and genetic testing or diagnosis was afforded in the first place now um to do this at scale the most important component was to bring clinicians um on the same page and that is the most difficult part because clinical medicine is pretty dogmatic right they would not do a test just because it is available they would not embrace a technology just because it's available they want proof that this works <laughs> so building that proof the trust was the biggest challenge in guardian but then once the initial collaborators or cohorts got built then people were quick to embrace the technology going forward so i, I would say of the 7 years uh, that we ran guardian the first 4 years was the most difficult but the last 3 years was uh, exponential because once the initial clinicians got to doing it got the benefits out of doing it the rest of the people just followed and i i believe that paved the way for the rest of us as well that program so because of that uh, now coming to technology as well, we mentioned technology so the advent of artificial intelligence nowadays so how do you think that fits in with the field of genomics and your projects even like how are you coping up with that or what are your ideas beyond that see artificial intelligence is something that is already doing a lot of groundwork or rather bulwark in genomics mm-hmm. right in fact uh, when you sequence a genome analyze interpreted genome in fact a significant component is already taken care by artificial intelligence if you use a tool for variant classification like sift or polyfin it's already mm-hmm. using ml and um, there's nothing new either i mean uh, polypen has been there for almost a decade or so now true okay yeah. now tools have become much better uh, and in fact it has become much better not just for the number crunching and the analysis but also to ensure that data is organized in a format that machines can read uh, so to put things in perspective uh, the first human genome took almost 30 runs of mm-hmm. sequencer uh today you can do in less than 48 hours right less than 24 hours in fact right now a lot of this acceleration happened because of two things first the throughput has increased and second the analytics and the compute required to handle the throughput have also improved uh like the 30 runs processing was a nightmare by itself but today it is just one not even one run a small proportion of the run and the analysis takes a few hours so the ability of ai to organize this in a very what i call legitimate format in for, for example looking at the clinical information and being able to suggest that these are the genes that you need to look for or looking at a set of variants and say that okay these variants look suspicious these kind of number crunching which used to take weeks mm-hmm. in the past today is possible to be done in seconds right and in in fact in routine clinical practice we do have a rapid whole genome sequencing where we do offer sequencing to report within 72 hours and this is only possible because of the compute advances mm-hmm. because we integrate ai mm-hmm. uh, in multiple different steps not just in the analysis interpretation but also before that in terms of crunching the clinical information to to arrive at a few differentials that we can sort of go for and look at so um, building on that as well because uh, with the ad, uh, the ai and genomics so what uh, in future looking ahead that is this entity so when i say when i try to say that and and try to put it in this perspective like for example if you do a whole genome sequence today and assume that you have a brca1 brca2 variant or assume that you have familial hypercholesterolemia variant you are still talking about discrete variants and their effects on lifetime risk of developing a condition right now that is practically because today's medicine is built on those discrete pieces of evidence to say that if you have a brca1 variant or brca2 variant this is your lifetime risk of developing it if you have this kind of a brca1 variant then parp inhibitors are effective so on so forth these are discrete entities that you have sort of built in you have never been able to build a holistic view to say that given brca1 
and given the background of many more genetic variants that this individual has, can I now accurately predict what is going to happen? Right? That would require looking at multiple data points, integrating multiple levels of evidence on, on discrete entities, but putting it together. This humans cannot do today. Right? In fact, even clinicians cannot do today. So right. even clinical diagnosis and prognostic is still on a on discrete entities and discrete diagnostic yeah. endpoints. Yeah. We have not been able to put in all this information together and say that okay, sixteen point nine years from now is your highest risk of getting this. Is the kind of things AI can do, right? But provided that I have enough background data and longitudinal data to be able to do this. So finally, the last question, which I think follows this is do you think and i think it's an age-old question that nowadays everybody is asking like will ai replace the full procedures at least the automation or computational sites that is see ai will replace a lot of mundane things right i will put this in perspective when i passed out of school uh, the most exotic thing to do was to learn typing sure. right because there were typewriters and uh, they were typewriting teaching institution mm -hmm. Today is unimaginable, yeah. right? That is because typewriting was an art at that point. Right? It is not there anymore. Does that mean the number of keyboards have increased or reduced? The answer is keyboards have exponentially increased. Now that computers have taken that role, right? the numbers of keyboards have exponentially increased compared to what typewriters used to be. Now, so it is not going to replace the jobs, it's only going to repurpose or reposition people. So I'd rather put it, it's not going to replace a clinician, it's not going to replace a bioinformatician, but it is going to replace a bioinformatician or a clinician who is doing mundane activity and is not taking the help of technology. So today, if you have a typist, yes, the typist would be replaced, but if you have a computer operator, then that repositioning is likely to happen. 